Okay, so welcome to staying afloat and keeping your people. This is all about ways to retain staff and navigate the stimulus options that are available to you right now in these difficult times of COVID-19. Now, before we get started into the session itself, then I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation, including their elders past and present. I'd like to acknowledge and respect the continuing culture and the contribution that they make to the life of this region. So in terms of the, um, the background that I bring to our session today, I've actually been in human resources for over 20 years now and have been operating my own business, Pauline Tarrant Consulting for the past seven. And so within that time, I've actually been involved in a lot of keynote speaking at conferences and seminars, also workshops, uh, training delivery on a variety of topics, um, both in-house um, bespoke training sessions and uh, other sessions. Uh, HR Health Checks has been a part of what I've actually delivered to people over the years too, uh, looking at where there could be improvements in practice and compliance for organisations. Also HR documentation, so helping people out with things like contracts and uh, their HR forms and processes, procedures, so on and so forth. The people technology, looking at HR systems and different software elements there. Uh, people strategy, so forming a HR strategy um, for the years ahead. And often that's a starting point that I use with clients just so that they can get the best possible value out of our relationship and arrangements. And wellness at work, where I bring my yoga teacher training into the workplace to help get the most out of meetings and interactions and experiences. So enough about me. Our session today will be looking at your obligations as an employer or enacting that on behalf of your employer if you're tuning in as a manager. We'll have a look at some sources of assistance that are available to you right now. And we'll have a look at some options that you might have if you're in uh, difficult times right now. And then finally, we'll move on to the Q&A. So if there is anything that I haven't covered off um, in the session at that point, then you can ask all of your detailed questions from there. Okay. So in terms of your obligations as an employer, your first obligation is to provide a safe place of work for your people. That's a really important one in a changing landscape right now. So you have a duty to provide a safe place of work in the face of COVID-19, which may mean that you've got to radically change your workplace to make sure your people are safe. It could be that you are implementing more remote working or working from home arrangements so that uh, anybody who does have to work from an office environment can do so while maintaining that physical distance from others. It may be that there's additional um, hand washing, which is hopefully happening um, for all of your people, uh, making sure you've got things in place like sanitizer and um, getting any gloves or any other equipment um, that is required as part of you providing that safe place of work. It's interesting on the safe place of work element, thinking about working from home as well. So there's a lot of people who are setting up a home office for the first time who might not be in an optimal environment for their own ergonomics. So it's good to think about how you might communicate with your staff to make sure that their home place, if that is their, their new workplace, is also a safe place for them to work. During these times, it's also essential to make sure that no matter how tough things get financially for your organisation, there's still an obligation to meet the national employment standards. And those should be made available to all members of staff when they first commence employment through the, um, the there's a statement that's available on the Fair Work website, the Fair Work Information Statement. And so in there, um, you can see it's actually just in the background of this slide. It covers things like your annual leave, personal leave, carer's leave, compassionate leave. It covers the maximum weekly hours that somebody can work. Um, it's also got the national minimum wage information in there too. Now, with those national employment standards, that is the bare minimum that everybody needs to adhere to. And of course, every workplace is different. Industries are different. You may have an award that covers your workplace. And so that's where you also need to refer to in terms of understanding what your minimum obligations might be. 
Now, I have heard a few interesting stories over the past few weeks and um, I was on 6PR just the other week with Ollie Peterson and I've actually had a few people saying that their employers were unilaterally trying to change their workplace conditions, their terms and conditions. And of course, that is something that cannot be done. Um, so if you are thinking about changing the terms and conditions for your staff, it needs to be a consultative process and you need their agreement. So uh, most staff in these times do understand that, that businesses can be impacted quite hard and um, there needs to be um, a level of flexibility shown uh, for people to retain employment. And uh, many people out there understand that it's better to have a job here right now that might only be doing three days a week instead of five days a week rather than not having a job at all. So please work through that agreement process with your people. You can potentially have that as an, an informal agreement. So it could be over a discussion, but please try and have that as a written agreement agreement as well, something that people have actually signed off to. At the very least, make sure that you've taken contemporaneous notes or you've actually noted down the actual agreement at that particular point in time. So you've got something for the file. Okay. Now, redundancy is something that is being looked at for some organizations but it really is a place of last resort and redundancy is where an employer no longer requires a role to be performed by anyone or it could be perhaps that you've got 10 people undertaking that role right now let's say in a cafe for example but because you're only able to offer takeaway service right now you only need five so there may be a legitimate redundancy um, situation um, arising out of that now um, the COVID-19 situation has actually meant that um, there can be significant downturns to, in, within many businesses. Many sectors have been hit really hard, um, not just hospitality, but things like the sporting industry, tourism, and a whole host of other organisations and sectors that have been impacted. Uh, but redundancy doesn't have to be the first option. In fact, I would strongly encourage you to look at other options. So your obligations, if you were thinking about a redundancy, are first to consult with your workplace. So if you haven't consulted with your workforce, if you've just sent everybody a text message to tell them not to come in tomorrow and they're all redundant, then you could be potentially in breach of the Fair Work Act. So if you haven't complied with this duty to consult, which is also um, reinforced in a whole number of different um, in, uh, workplace awards as well, then there could be issues um, through Fair Work. They, if, with every breach of the Fair Work Act, there are actually financial penalties and they can mount up really quite quickly, especially if those breaches were against large numbers of staff. So please consult with your workforce if there are difficult times that you're facing right now. And it's amazing what you can actually come up with. So back in the GFC times, back in 2008, there were organizations that were heavily impacted by the global financial crisis. And they actually looked upon the consultant, um, the consulting requirements um, as being a real source of innovation for their organizations. And they found a lot of people were happy to amend their hours to keep their jobs. Now there's a whole host of sources of assistance and it can be really quite confusing. Um, because you hear different news updates coming through every day and sometimes there's different um, pundits and commentators um, pulling this all apart and they've got slightly different views and there are pieces of legislation that are actually being pulled together really very quickly right now. Um, so they might not be perfect but they're all aimed at pushing things in, in the right direction and saving jobs and also minimising the economic impact at this difficult time. And so I'm going to run through a whole host of these and hopefully there's some that are um, useful for your um, business. So the government, of course, um, will have a whole host of um, elements there. The ATO um, has got a whole host of help as well. Um, your bank can be a source of help, your landlord, potentially your insurance company may be a source of help and your utility supplier. Now, I realise that we've got a whole host of different people and organisations on the phone today. Uh, sorry, dialing in today. And uh, with that, um, you may be a large entity or you may even be a sole trader um, or the only person who's um, working within a business. And so this 
information is designed to be quite broad um, in its content. Now, the federal government has got some really great resources online and um, the key websites to really keep an eye on as things continue to evolve, as the stimulus packages become clearer in their intent and their eligibility. Uh, you can find lots of really great information on treasury.gov.au and also on business.gov.au. So the sorts of things that the federal government is putting in place right now is some cash flow support for small and medium businesses. And um, within that, the eligibility for those are on those websites I just mentioned. There's temporary relief available for financially distressed businesses. And um, there is also a change to the instant asset write-off amount. So um, that's been um, uh, bumped up quite significantly there. Um, and um, just sort of going back to that cash flow support, um, so it can be supportive up to $100,000. And, and that isn't just um, commercial businesses, that also includes not-for-profits. So that's all about keeping um, staff employed, ideally helping organisations pay their rent, pay their bills. And um, there are forms available um, to apply for many of these different elements. Um, now, um, these sorts of um, stimulus measures are all designed at providing a safety net for business um, that can really help avoid organisations um, falling into um, insolvency. And there are additional protections around insolvency. And um, if you are concerned that your organisation could be in a position of potential insolvency, um, there's been new legislation, new protections put out there for directors in that situation all around the safe harbour um, legislation that was recently passed. Now, um, there are also um, relief elements available through the ATO um, and that instant asset write-off that I mentioned, um, that is actually moving from um, 30,000 up to 150,000. Um, so that's for businesses that have got a turnover of less than 50 million, um, sorry, 500 million. Um, and that is extending just till the end of this financial year. So if you were planning um, some big investments or you've already put in place some big invest uh, investments into your business this financial year, then there's the potential to look at claiming that back. Um, there is also a um, backing business incentive. Um, this is um, going to be running through till next June. Um, and so this, this is also looking at businesses that have got a turnover of less than 500 million. Um, so it's been able to deduct 50% of the cost of an eligible asset on installation. Um, and uh, so there's some potential help there. Um, there's individual help according to regions, so it's worth actually keeping an eye out um, on um, the state and federal government websites around any special help that might be available in regions. And there's also, of course, the JobKeeper wage subsidy, which is absolutely fantastic, and I will be covering that in a little bit more detail in just a moment. Now, the state government has got a whole host of help available as well. So if you're a larger organisation and you're paying payroll tax, then um, there are um, changes to that. So um, the payroll tax threshold increase has been brought forward. Um, so that means that um, you might be able to slip under that threshold for a while longer um, as an entity, um, or it may be that you're previously paying payroll tax and now you're under that threshold and so it's no longer required. And there are some grants available. So this is all to be applied for um, through the state government. So you can see there's a um, $17,500 grant um, for those um, businesses with a payroll of 1 million um, and 4 million. Um, there's also the ability to take advantage of um, the WA government waiving rent payments. So if you are leasing property from the state government, then um, there's um, a period of six months where rent is no longer payable. And uh, there's also many um, of the local governments that are following in the footsteps of the state government. So it could be that, let's say you're in a not-for-profit organisation, then it may be that um, you're actually able to um, get further reductions or um, free rental periods for that. Um, payroll tax is actually going to be waived for four months if you are a WA-based business um, with annual wages under 7.5 million. 
Um, so the WA Treasury website will have much more information on that if you fall into that category. And um, affected businesses can actually apply for payment arrangements. So if you are falling behind on your payroll tax, then please speak up soon so that you can enter into arrangements um, around um, repaying that payroll tax over a longer period of time. But it can also apply to the transfer duty, landholder duty, and vehicle license duty or land tax. There's also a whole raft of different business license fees that have been waived. So that includes liquor licensing, um, because that's in recognition of the downturn that the hospitality industry has sadly faced. And there will be refunds given to businesses that have already paid those licenses. And if you're a, a smaller business, then the Small Business Development Corporation is another great way of keeping up to date there. Now, the JobKeeper payment, which all passed through Parliament um, quite easily last week, which is a, a real relief. Um, so if your business has been impacted, then you can actually choose to participate through the scheme. And it's worth registering. If you're not sure, please just register and then, then the ATO will work through your eligibility from there. So um, looking at the ATO, if you just pop into your search engine, ATO, JobKeeper payment, it'll take you great through to some great resources that have got full information in there. So you needed to have employed somebody on the 1st of March. And now, unfortunately, the 1st of March was a, a Sunday. So if you employed somebody who started on the Monday, um, then that person isn't an eligible employee. But everybody who is employed at that date is potentially eligible. Um, and that is, of course, if you had um, eligible employees, which means that they were part-time, full-time or long-term casual, so more than 12 months service. And um, also you need to have seen a fall in turnover. Um, for smaller businesses, you're looking at 30% um, fall in turnover. And um, for anyone who's got a business that's more than a billion, then you're looking at a 50% drop in turnover. Or if you are from a not-for-profit or an ACNC registered charity, then just a 15% drop in turnover will be enough for you to be able to register for the JobKeeper scheme. And the um, ATO has got a whole host of information around the eligibility of this. Um, there are some ineligible um, categories in there. So the JobKeeper payment is the same for everybody who's eligible so with that it's fifteen hundred dollars per fortnight so apologies for the error up there <laughs> i've just noticed i put up there fifteen hundred dollars per week it is actually per fortnight and um, so that is paid as a job subsidy that then you pass on to people if you have a part-timer and they earn more than fifteen hundred dollars per fortnight um, then you would keep on paying them that higher rate if they're still working. If they've been stood down, then you would just pass on that 1500 If your part-timer normally earns less, let's say they only earn $800 per fortnight, then you actually still top them up to that 1500 per fortnight. Because this is all about providing a stimulus to the economy and it needs to be passed on in full. Now, because the legislation is very new, it is somewhat scant in detail. And so for the next few weeks, we're hoping that the ATO will actually help to refine exactly how this works. Because um, of course, if you've got somebody who is stood down right now, um, so if you've already stood down people, then potentially um, they can receive this money um, and you wouldn't need to pay super because they're not being asked to work. Whereas if you are expecting people to work and they're working full time right now and they're going to continue working full time and you're getting this wonderful job subsidy to keep them working full time and um, then it's likely that their full time hours are deemed ordinary hours and so things like super would be on top of that um, but that is all remaining to be defined by um, the ATO there. So you need to be paying people to get the subsidy so with that um, there needs to be um, a payment that is made to staff. So um, if you're pretty sure that you should get the subsidy, um, a lawyer that I was on a um, conference call with in yesterday was saying, well, really people should be getting paid that subsidy right now because the ATO will be having a look at your um, payroll 
um, through the single touch payroll system to see what sort of people you've got on your books right now. Now some really positive news is that you can actually re-engage workers that have been made redundant and this is something I would strongly recommend because this is what's going to help your business be in a great position to start off when restrictions start to lift, when you can start trading normally or um, closer to normal um, when things improve over the next few months. So it's really good to actually have a look at um, re-engaging people and with that it would be a matter of working back okay what do we do about that redundancy payment if people receive one? And you may come to some kind of an agreement where um, you'd look at what payment was made, what the JobKeeper allowance is, would be over that period of time. And so um, there might be some adjustments um, that would need to go through your payroll um, to reconfigure things as a JobKeeper payment rather than a redundancy and termination payment. And then elements such as reinstating leave would just need to happen through the process as well. So now is a good time to be kind to your payroll people because they've potentially got quite a lot of uh, work ahead of them implementing this JobKeeper payment. But it's such a fantastic scheme and it's a great way of boosting business. So as I mentioned, the payment does apply to people who've already been stood down and um, it's a great way of actually passing on some support to them. And sole traders and business owners actively engaged in a business um, that information hasn't been released as yet, um, but it will be coming out very, very soon. So um, there is a level of eligibility for sole traders and people, let's say, um, that are operating a proprietary limited organisation. Maybe there's just one person. Um, but um, for people who are actively engaged in a business, who, is a, who are a business owner, um, if you've got a partnership, for example, it's looking like only one of the partners can actually get the dog keeper payment. So there are some interesting little things that, um, that need to still be worked out within the legislation. Now, um, within the job keeper scheme, if you are an eligible business for the job keeper scheme, this actually opens up a whole raft of additional flexibility that you can have in your organization with your people. So it does actually give you the ability to stand down individual employees. So standing down employees, um, it might be something that you've got in your contract of employment or an enterprise agreement. Otherwise, Section 524 of the Fair Work Act covers stand down for workers. And this would normally be across a whole workforce or a, or a whole proportion of a workforce. So it could be if you've got a manufacturing facility, let's say um, you're, you've got a winery, let's say, and you say, okay, well, we're not producing um, wine right now. So the, sort of the people who do all the fancy wine making stuff and the wine tasting, we don't need you right now, but we're actually doing something else over here. So the manufacturing people that are focused on um, making hand sanitizer, which is our new pivot and shift, um, then those people um, would not be stood down. They'd have ongoing employment there. Um, so that's how things may operate traditionally, but now you can actually stand down individuals if you are eligible for this JobKeeper scheme. You also have the ability under this scheme to unilaterally reduce hours. So if you're in a really sticky situation and then you need to cut down um, your payroll costs quickly, then you do have the ability to reduce those hours with people. You can also direct employees to take annual leave as long as they've got a leave balance of at least two weeks. Now, normally you would have to, um, you'd only have the ability to do that under let's say an award or other provision um, if it was deemed excessive, which is often more than six weeks. So this is a great way of actually um, being able to cut down your leave liability um, because that leave balance sits there and in the unfortunate event of a redundancy or a resignation, you have to pay that anyway. So now is a good time to perhaps um, get that off your balance sheet if you are eligible within the scheme. There's also the ability for employees to take leave at half pay if you fall under the scheme. Now, this can be administratively difficult for your payroll people and they may have enough challenges as it is. So something that might be better is if somebody was going to take the next two weeks off, let's say they're a full timer um, and um, rather than actually having it as half pay, um, which is a whole nother lot of configurations in the system, then you could say, okay, well, over the next pay fortnight, they going to have five unpaid days and five pay days and it all balances out in the wash when they get their next pay packet. 
Now, there may be some changes that come up with access to long service leave. So New South Wales have already put provisions in place around long service leave. And look, if you're based in Western Australia, there already is some flexibility around paying out long service leave. People can actually cash that in and there is a little bit of flexibility. Um, but there may be more changes coming. So that is up to the state governments to work on. And uh, so it's a bit of a watch this space. It may be that they don't get the chance to get around to it with everything else going on but if this whole lockdown process is a little bit more protracted in nature then we might see some movement here too uh, but in all these changes if you do fall under this job keeper scheme and you can make some unilateral changes but you must still make sure that everybody is paid at or above the relevant minimum wage so with that um, if you've got somebody who is paid on an award let's say they're a level three worker and the social home care community services and disability industry award um, then that fifteen hundred dollars per fortnight for a full-time worker is not going to be enough you can't just get them to do full-time hours um, for a payment that low you need to make sure you're still paying at the relevant minimum wage which could be the national minimum wage or the award um, and if of course you've got people under an enterprise agreement uh, then if you're seeking to vary that, which you can seek a variation in that agreement, that needs to come by the agreement of staff. And so um, it's worth having a look through the Fair Work Ombudsman website. There's some great bench books on there around looking at um, negotiations and variations to agreements. Now, the Fair Work website's got a whole page dedicated to fair, uh, coronavirus, so it's a really great place to look for more information. Um, now, if you are a small trader, sorry, a sole trader, a small organisation and you're looking for some personal relief, or maybe if you're looking for some personal relief in general, then the government is allowing individuals to access um, their superannuation if they meet certain criteria. Um, so there's $10,000 available this year and next year. Um, but this is really a um, point of last resort. Um, some financial analysts have said, well, taking out um, $10,000 super right now, particularly if you're quite young, um, could mean that you end up with a balance $100,000 less further down the line. So it is very much a last resort, not let's just raid the piggy bank for now and worry about the consequences later. So that's why you've seen quite a bit on the news recently where um, real estate agents that have been um, telling to tenants they should be tapping into their super rather than um, skimping on rental payments uh, have come under fire there and so some other organisations. So if you are um, passing on information like these measures on to your employees, just um, let them know that it's only as a, a last resort option and encourage them to seek proper financial advice. Because of course, none of us are qualified financial advisors. Well, I'm certainly not, you may well be. If you are, then um, good luck to you. You can share these sorts of uh, detailed information with people and maybe encourage them if it's the right thing to do for them. Now, your bank may be another source of help. So this applies to you personally, um, tuning into the webinar today, as well as um, looking at um, the um, state of your business. So um, there is relief for um, commercial clients um, within the banking sector, as well as employees. And look, it's great to actually have a think about the financial well-being of your existing workforce, because it can be a huge dis distraction for people. Um, so if they need to focus on the job, but they're really worried about losing the roof over their head, um, then you're not going to get the best out of people. So if you can um, get, get people to search in the right kind of places um, for information, there is a great um, website that the, um, the government has set up. I think it's the Money Matters website, um, which has got some really responsible information on there. So... Um, Westpac, for example, they are allowing um, organisations to defer principal and interest um, payments on business loans, on car loans um, and um, equipment loans. So those deferred payments, um, at the moment, a lot of banks are looking at around about six months of deferrals. But of course, it's a bit of a let's wait and see how things go. Um, then um, also commercial properties, so um, when making payments on there, 
um, then um, there are relief elements um, available. Um, so there's protection around evicting tenants on the um, basis of non-payment of rent. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. So um, there are some um, eligibility criteria for banking support as well. Um, and so, um, for example, Westpac there, they've got um, a criteria where they say that the business needs to be operating in Australia, needs to have less than 20% foreign ownership. Um, and um, then there's also criteria if your um, customers are um, above the 3 million total business exposure there. So anyone who um, has um, fixed rate periods, then those can be extended also, um, and loan periods can also be extended. Now, your bank can also provide some relief around um, the terminal fees. So if you're operating a um, public facing outlet somewhere, um, perhaps um, and dealing with general public transactions, this is probably something that you face. So um, there are some rental fee refunds available, um, and service free, uh, fee free periods um, that are available. And so those are tending to be focused on relief for smaller customers, less than 5 million per annum. Um, as I mentioned, many other banks are doing same, uh, similar things. So Bendigo Bank, they've got a big focus on relief for small businesses. So really get in touch with your banks, see what they can actually offer you right now. And these situations continue to evolve. So if you spoke to them a month ago, looking at their relief measures, it may be that they've got more that they can actually offer you today. Now, your landlord might be another source of help for your business right now. So it's a good time to actually have a good look at your lease document um, and have a think about what your affordability is right now and what factors are unique to your business um, or what is actually impacting um, the whole of the sector that you operate in. So you can actually be all fully clued up, ready to go into those negotiations. It may be that within those negotiations, you can um, enter into temporary um, rent holiday periods, um, perhaps if you've had to um, close um, an outlet, let's say if you operate a pub, for example, um, then you might be able to get um, some relief there. Um, also, some organisations are moving to turnover only rent, so um, your rental payments um, connected there with a the drop in turnover, um, there's a, a equivalent drop in rent there. And evictions are actually being put on hold for um, the next six months for commercial um, tenants who are unable to meet their um, commitments due to the impact of coronavirus. So within that, um, the, um, the, there are actually also some um, additional codes of protection that are available to businesses that are eligible for that JobKeeper payment. So again, this is another great reason to apply for the JobKeeper scheme. Um, because there's another extension of where help is available um, and um, there's more information available um, on that sort of protection on business.gov.au. Now insurance might be a useful source of help for organisations so it could be that um, if you're operating a small business you may have income protection insurance so it's worth actually um, looking into that if you've had a big drop off in your income. Um, then, and there's, it's unlikely, but there is a slim possibility you might be able to get some business interruption insurance. Uh, the pandemic is often seen as being an act of God, so to speak. So with that, um, it's unlikely, but you never know. It's worth a bit of a look in there to see if you can actually make a claim. And um, it's worth also checking that your equipment that you may have provided to employees to work from home. So if you've been allowing employees to take home monitors and their laptops and other equipment, then make sure your equipment is covered by your insurance off premises. Because of course, there's all sorts of things that can happen um, in the home that uh, might not happen um, within the workplace. Um, utilities is another area. So um, within Western Australia, there's um, some credits available for small businesses that have got low power consumption there. So a $2,500 credit there. Um, and there's a commitment that power and water disconnections are not going to occur. And there's not going to be 
um, interest charged on any deferred payments until later this year. Now those are um, around small businesses and there's more information available on the Small Business Development Corporation website. Okay, so the sorts of options you can be looking at right now. So let's say you've put in place all of those other measures, you've got the JobKeeper scheme, you have negotiated with your landlord, you've got some great new arrangements with your bank, um, you've got things organized in terms of support from the state government, um, and also a little bit of relief on your utilities. If you are still facing difficulties, um, then there's some options you can look at with your people before we get to a redundancy point. So one of the first things can be look at a recruitment freeze. Even if you're looking at vacancies in your organisation right now, is there anything that you can do to reshuffle your staff so that you can still maintain employment for everyone there? Because of course, under the Fair Work Act and legislation, then there is a duty not just to consult if you are in a potential redundancy situation, but also to redeploy. So to redeploy somebody to like work. Now, that's something that uh, must be worked through. And if you haven't done that as part of your process, then it could be deemed an unfair dismissal. And the last thing you need right now with all of this crazy COVID-19 chaos going on is a court case going through fair work. Another element you could look at is implementing a pay freeze with your staff and it will be interesting to see what happens to the national minimum wage coming up. So uh, the national minimum wage is normally increased 1st of July every year and then that triggers a whole raft of similar increases across the 122 different modern awards that cover Australian workplaces and cover the majority of Australian employees. Um, there's no clear indicators right now. Some pundits are saying, right, well, we think that because of everything going on, it's going to be a 0% increase. But then you've got people like Sally McManus from the ACTU that are saying, look, if you want to kickstart this economy, people have to have cash in their pockets to go and spend. And so if you're not going to bump up that national minimum wage, consumer spending is going to remain suppressed. So we'll see what happens because the ACTU are going, oh, let's have like 4% increases. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's going to be a 4% increase. It will be interesting to see how it all pans out and it, there won't be any quick decision. It's probably going to be June time until we actually find out what's happening around that. So if you're already paying above award rates or if you're in an award-free workplace paying well above the national minimum wage, um, then you can have a chat to your staff about um, letting them know that this year there's probably not going to be a pay freeze if that's what you need to do in your business. It's also worth asking your staff to temporarily reduce contracted hours and um, working through this it's good to have the end goal in mind. So having a look at your payroll, have a look at what savings need to be made, have a look at what might happen, um, need to happen to make those savings happen. So I've got one client, for example, and they have um, just recently gone through a negotiation process with all of their staff. They needed to make a 40% cut in payroll. Staff costs were a big proportion of their business expenditure right now. So they went out to everybody. They gave the full background of this is why we're doing it. This is what we're seeking. This is how long we're seeking it for. We'd love to have your questions. Um, and um, then had managers actually speak to individuals, talk about their situations, what difficulties they're facing. And in the end, they actually got everybody to agree to a 40% reduction. So after that, um, when that was agreed informally with the manager, with some contemporaneous notes taken at the time to record the meeting, then we confirmed things with an agreement letter that confirmed that temporary change to their contracted hours. So um, with that, um, although if you are an eligible JobKeeper organisation and you can make a change to people's hours without working through that consultation and agreement process, it leaves a bit of a bad feeling in people's mouths if all of a sudden you kind of chuck them a letter telling them that they're having their, um, their pay slashed. So it is good to still continue with that whole process of consultation and agreement. But of course, ultimately, you might need to make some tough decisions and make cuts there. Um, you can um, look at a reduction in um, salaries as well as reducing hours. So um, often the reducing the hours, you just pro rata that back 
Um, so instead of paying somebody five days a week, they're cutting by 40%, you'd be paying three days a week, for example. Um, or it could be that you need to keep people working full time, um, but because you've pivoted into a new industry which isn't as profitable, perhaps just to survive, you do need to actually have a temporary reduction in salaries, yet still maintain those hours. So that is a potential there of um, avoiding redundancies. You can, of course, also, if you um, are needing to reduce your um, debt liability, um, which of course includes your leave liability, invite people to take some leave. And if you've got a quiet time, now is the perfect time to let people take a bit of extra leave, run down those leave balances a bit. So hopefully when restrictions start lifting soon, um, then you'll be there, your staff will feel all well and truly refreshed and revitalised and ready to get back to work. Now, if you still haven't made the savings that you need to by that point in time, that's where you could explore looking at voluntary redundancies. Um, and um, these can sometimes be a little bit difficult to manage, but it may be that you've got people who are happy to move on. And um, information on what the payment of redundancies actually looks like is available on the Fair Work website. Um, or you can have a look at um, the shutdown option, or you may even look at all of these and just slowly step through them until you get to a um, point of last resort. Um, so if you really can't make the um, savings that you need um, through um, different measures and take advantage of the stimulus payments that you really need, um, then have a look at stand down, um, looking at um, standing down whole sections of workforce, or if you come under JobKeeper, then potentially even just standing down individuals if you need to. And of course, the last resort is implementing forced redundancies. And it may be for one reason or another, it is simply too challenging to continue. And that's where you go to. But also to offer a little bit of hope, these are times where you can look at innovating, doing something a little bit different. And um, I was on a uh, webinar with a lady a couple of weeks ago who had just got back from France and she was talking about this fantastic bakery and they'd really taken advantage of the fact that people were having more time at home and potentially wanting to um, entertain their family and they got a bit more time to do things than they used to. So rather than going out and buying their daily loaf of bread um, from the bakery, uh, the bakery were actually selling little um, sourdough starter kits and all sorts of little kits so people could actually bake their own bread at home. And that was a wonderful way of actually um, them um, highlighting themselves, having a real point of difference in a difficult time and really empathizing with their client base and having a think about where they're coming from and what they might be looking for right now. But even closer to home, so the Harris River Estates, which is down in Collie, have done some wonderful in innovation. So they've been making wine for a while and they decided to diversify into making gin. Um, but I don't think they've actually even got around to ever making any gin because just as they've got everything all organised, then COVID-19 hits. And um, they're one of the many organisations in the alcohol sector that have actually switched to hand sanitizer. So they're now actually distributing this hand sanitizer all around the Collie area for people. Um, and um, they are doing um, the great thing that many people are doing right now is the kind thing of, okay, who's really in need? Who can we help right now? And they've actually donated hand sanitizer to people at risk. So people in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community that live around there, also people that are elderly, other vulnerable members of the population. And then it's also available for sale locally. Unfortunately, there, there are difficulties around posting hand sanitizer, so I don't think they're doing any mail delivery at this point in time. Um, but um, yeah, if you're down in the uh, Tools of the Southwest area, then that might be a good option if you're running short right now. So please have a chat with your staff. There may be ways that you can still pivot your business right now and enter in a, into a whole new amazing um, domain. There are sources of help available if you as a business owner or manager are struggling right now. So Helping Minds have actually got some um, free services. So if you offer a, um, an EAP service right now, but staff don't want to use it, sometimes there can be a little bit of a, oh, I'm a bit worried about what get back, gets back to my employer. This is a useful option. It is free to everybody. If you are a small business owner and you don't have an EAP service, Helping Minds offer this and it is available there 
you just call up between 8.30 and 4.30, Monday to Friday, um, and you can get phone or video counselling anytime between 7am and 7pm. And um, those up to three sessions are free and they're all with a mental health um, professional. Um, so uh, some great services there. Um, and so feel free to pass that on to people in your workplace. Um, there's also other support services like Beyond Blue, Lifeline. But of course, if there is anybody who is in a critical emergency, if their life is at risk, if their health is in danger, please just dial triple zero. It is the best thing that you can do. And then you can actually get the support of trained professionals immediately to help in that situation. There's also some great resources available for financial counselling. And so there's the National Debt Helpline that is available, um, and that's a free confidential service there. And the Money Smart website I mentioned is also a great website to um, look at helping you manage your money, money. There's some great budgeting tools on there and all sorts. And um, there's all kinds of other support services around domestic violence, the 1-800-RESPECT, um, Men's Line and Men's Referral Service, and also Kids Helpline that's available out there too for any kids that are struggling, because of course a lot of kids have been cut off from their social networks, um, cut off from their um, normal schooling routines and things like that, and are facing some challenges too. So thank you so much for your time so far. And I will just stop sharing the screen up here. And so we can um, just take some questions. So if anybody has any questions, then please um, let me know. I will um, just um, move to take you off mute. Okay. So feel free to speak up if you do have any questions right now. And if you don't feel comfortable talking, that's okay. You can pop them up in the chat box. Thanks very much, Kate, for the feedback. Now, um, if you do have anybody who you think might be interested in any of the other sessions today, there's still time to register. We actually have a session on at one o'clock, which is for employees looking at um, helping themselves in these um, challenging times and also how they can um, behave constructively to help um, in their workplace, help to save jobs in their workplace. And then at, towards the end of the day, three o'clock WA time, we also have a session uh, to help people that are searching for work. So um, great question there from Agatha around the uh, slide deck. So um, on there, um, I will be releasing a recording of this session. So that will all be available on there. And if you did want a separate slide deck, feel free to drop me a line and I can pop those through. Um, now, Sharon, um, in terms of how you speak at the moment, you are unmuted. So Hopefully, if your microphone is working okay, we'll be able to hear from you. So, um, do you want to test that out now? Okay, I can't hear anything just now, but if you could um, maybe, Sharon, pop your... Um, question in the chat box and then we can make sure we answer that. Pauline, hi, it's Lisa. Oh, hi Lisa, how are you? Good, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Um, great um, presentation and thanks for sharing the slides. Just a quick one. Um, yeah. In terms of um, the, I suppose, mutual change or not mutual change in any contract, um, at the moment, the executives are trying to push that we um, post, allow the employee to access a letter that agrees to that change and tell us otherwise if they don't. So, and I'm not too comfortable with that because it doesn't offer any kind of document to sign or agree. Instead, it, 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 I suppose it tells them to acknowledge it. And if they don't acknowledge it, they have to let us know, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look. As I mentioned, um, 
in law a contract can be verbal so um mm. arrangements can be verbal but it's just too risky really i mean i personally um would be recommending to all of my clients to make sure that there is a proper contract variation letter yeah. and um you know what there's some amazing free resources out there um i've actually she attended a couple of really great webinars um, with an organization called Employment Hero recently. And um, they've actually even got just a free template on their website that um, has um, a contract variation um, letter in there. Um, or if anybody needs anything more um, bespoke and tailored to their organization, um, I've been doing that for several of my mm. clients over the past few weeks as well. Yeah. I don't think the template would be a problem. I think they're just worried about the burden of administration and actually getting it through quicker than they'd like to so they can get an agreement. And they've used, I mean, and I'm trying to push against it, but they've used the words that it's not a consultation now, but if they refuse to, that's when it would turn into a consultation. And I'm like, mm, okay. Yeah, it has to be a consultation really, unless you're falling under that job keeper category. So said, yeah, okay. You really do need to follow that consultation process. This is um, also... Um, if you have an award or um, perhaps even in your contract of employment, you might have some wording in there about the um, requirement to the consult change. Mm. Uh, yeah, a major workplace change, which of course any significant reduction to hours and salary, that's what this represents. Yeah, we've got 11 EBAs, so this is going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, 11 EBAs, that sounds like quite a challenge, particularly, look, you know, if, yeah. Um, with 11 EBAs, if you've got a really large workforce, then um, you might even be better off looking at um, varying your ABAs. I mean, you still have to go through a vote process, um, mm. but then at least in some ways you could go, it's a bit simpler because all you need is a majority and then it applies mm. to everybody. Um, That's it. Individual arrangements, you need to get each individual to sign up to it. So it mm. might be a route out of this is to look at the EBA. Okay, thank you. That's all right. Right, any other questions from anybody? Okay, great, thanks Sharon. So Sharon, you've mentioned you've got many casual staff who would be eligible for JobKeeper. Um, so yeah, with the casual staff, they need to have been um, employed as of the 1st of March, and they also need to be long-term casual. So they need to have been with you for more than 12 months. And so provided they hit that, then um, yes, you're right. It is an all or nothing assistance. So if you opt in, you need to include um, all of your eligible staff. Um, and um, you are right. It is a significant financial cost to bear in advance before you get the reimbursement from the government one month later. Um, could you get, um, could you speak to staff and get their permission to pay them later? Um, that is something that it's actually, it's worth asking the ATO about that um, because the ATO are looking for those people being on your books and being active employees right now. So um, with that, the recommendation that's been put out there so far is that you do actually pay them right now and you find some ways to do that. And there may be other sources of financial relief. So if you have been able to um, you know, come to arrangements with your landlord, take advantage of payroll tax um, breaks um, and any other um, tax breaks or assistance, um, then that's potentially there for you. But it's worth keeping an eye on that um, ATO website. I was hoping we'd have a bit more information released by now because the uh, legislation has been out for a week now. Um, but, um, yeah, they're still trying to work through some of the detail there. Um, in terms of submitting the pay through STP now, but sending the bank payments later, um, I wouldn't recommend that um, because you've got to, the, the actual, the, 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 the payroll system is meant to accurately reflect the payments that are actually going out through your business um, so that your pay slips reflect that and so on and so forth. So um, with that, yeah, it is a tough one. Uh, you, you do really need to be making the payments unless you can get some kind of um, information from the ATO that actually says that you can get some relief from that because they do realize that business owners are operating in extenuating circumstances. So um, yeah, it's definitely worth um, getting in touch with the ATO about that. Understandably, it is difficult to get through right now because they are getting a lot of inquiries. Okay, any other questions? 
So um, Carrington Foods, thank you very much. So with, um, if people have been let go after the JobKeeper period, do you need to rehire them on the same conditions? Um, so uh, not necessarily, you need to rehire them in some form. So it could be that you rehire them um, on an arrangement where they, uh, a full-time person is part-time as from the 1st of March. Um, and um, that part-time arrangement is whatever the award or agreement you've got in place. Um, you just go, okay, well, $1,500 across those hours equals however many um, hours, however much per hour. Um, and, um, and then you can look at um, re-engaging um, people there. Um, in terms of re-engaging as casuals, um, uh, I guess, well, that's, I, I would err away from casuals just because, um, of course, people need to be employed as at the 1st of March and they need to either be a um, part-time, full-time or a casual with more than 12 months of service. So rehiring as casuals might not qualify for that 12 months of service element. So I'd err more around the, um, the um, part-time or you could re-engage as full-time but if you're not requiring those people to work right now, they could be on a stand down. Hope that helps. Okay, well, it is 11 o'clock, but I'll squeeze in one more question. If anybody else has got another question, feel free to um, speak up on the microphone or to pop a question in the chat box. Hey, Pauline, it's Agatha here. How are you? Hi, good, thanks. How are you? Good, good, good. Great presentation. Thank you very much. I think it's, um, you know, it's very helpful for a lot of small businesses. I do have one quick question, if you don't mind. It's um, if someone potentially signed a contract uh, before 1st of March, so a new contract for employment, uh, however, starting date post 1st of March, uh, let's say 15th of March. Yeah. Um, what is the obligation for a small business to keep this person uh, because contract was signed before 1st of March? And yeah. is there, um, uh, I guess, is there a room where the small business actually able to get out of this contract uh, without being responsible uh, to serve it, to, to, you know, to, to employ uh, an employee? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. You've got a couple of different options there. Sadly, because although the contract was signed before the 1st of March yet, uh, um, they didn't start until the 15th. So JobKeeper isn't eligible on that particular point in time. In terms of terminating the contract, there's a number of different elements that are available. Of course, it is great to preserve employment wherever possible. Whereas if that is not possible right now and um, you've gone through all of those steps on that blue kind of bar table that I put up there, uh, that chart, um, then um, there are options certainly to terminate. So you can terminate in probation and with that um, you have a decision whether or not that person would pay in lieu of notice. So often within a um, probation um, it might be that um, only one week's notice is actually required to be served. Uh, so it's, it's, you could do a probation termination or you could do a redundancy um, but either way, it's the same thing because um, unless there is a different redundancy policy in place to the, that is more generous than the statutory norm, no one gets a redundancy payment when they've only been um, with an employer for a few months or a few weeks. So uh, there's some options there. I mean, really, if you end in employment because there is no work, it is an actual redundancy situation. Um, but um, like I said, no redundancy payment and um, work out or pay that notice. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. And then, um, yes, uh, it, this is actually for a friend. And, and I think there's a very sound um, advice. And yes, I mean, as you mentioned, I think a couple of times before is, I think this is a time to be kind. Mm. But of course, uh, at the end of the day, every small business has also have to make sure the business continuity side of things of their business. So thank Definitely. you. Definitely. No worries. And of course, there's always the stand down provision there. So if that um, business is um, requiring to stand down different functions, then of course you can stand down different groups of people potentially, or if they are eligible for JobKeeper for um, the rest of their workforce, then they could actually stand down individuals, including this one. And then hopefully things pick up in another couple of months and then there will be um, work for that person at that point in time. And then they'll be there ready to go. Um, because 
it, people on stand down, if they're not eligible for job keepers, then they're also available, uh, potentially eligible for job seekers. And luckily Centrelink have actually cut the requirement for documentation now. So it used to be that they would actually need documentation from a prior employer to say that employment had ended. And now they'll just take things on face value because they know that they need to process payments out to people as fast as possible um, so that uh, people aren't placed in financial hardship. Okay, well, thank, thank you. you so much to everybody. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to tune in and hopefully the information that we've gone through has helped you in your business. Hopefully it helps to save some jobs and um, the recording will be available soon. So you'll get a link um, with all of that information on there. So please take care and all the best.